Well, welcome, family. Today we're going to talk about the person that God often lays on your heart in prayer and how those prayers might just change the world as you go give hope to your community and to others around you. But first, if you've earned the right to invite someone to be a part of this gathering and they don't know who I am, my name is Lee Brown. I'm the lead pastor for this gathering of Jesus followers who are experiencing the reality that when you turn your heart back to God, it truly, truly, truly can happen that he shows up in amazing ways. So we're going to start a conversation that hopefully spills into your devotionals through the impact guide. If you don't have one of these, they're right out that bottom set of doors uh, on the resource wall. And this is a great time to hop back into a group if you haven't gotten into one yet, because this is a uh, new series and a new start for that. So I want to start off with a quick question. It's an easy, gentle question. Have you ever heard from God? Right, just light, fair to start us out, right? Like, have you ever heard, not maybe a, an audible voice, but, but have you ever had God speak something into your spirit? Now, before you think that that's a creepy pasta, let me just tell you what I don't mean. I don't mean, have you been sitting in your car and suddenly the Holy Spirit moves in such a way that your car fills up with some like translucent goo. I know it's October, but this isn't a horror movie. What I mean is whether in prayer, most likely in prayer, or living your day-to-day -day life, have you ever felt the Spirit of God speaking something specific that was just for you? A few of your nodding your heads. See, I didn't grow up in a tradition that put too much emphasis on hearing the Spirit. I, we always talked about how you hear from God in His Word, and that's true, like shockingly so at times, right? Uh, but I didn't grow up in a tradition where we talked about the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But a few years ago, some of you may remember, uh, in our pre-launch phase, we had a guy on our staff named Jake Brashler. Uh, Jake was our worship and children's pastor in our pre-launch phase. And one of the great joys and foundational moments for setting who we are as a church, we prepared Jake to be a lead pastor. We called it out of him, gave him opportunities, equipped him. And at 22 years old, he became a lead pastor. So pause for a sec. Thank you, Altitude, for being equippers. That is something to celebrate big time. We are a church who equips people in our midst to go into our community and across the country to lead people to experience Jesus. Thank you for that. So as Jake's boss, as Jake's pastor when he was here, right? Jake used to tell me about these times where he would feel the Holy Spirit moving in very specific ways. Like one time, uh, he was sharing about how uh, a couple years back before this, he had been working at a restaurant and he felt the Holy Spirit very specifically tell him to go to one of his tables and tell them that they needed to forgive themselves for what happened to their daughter. And Jake wrestled with this for a while because, right, uh, A, he, he doesn't know these people, and, and, and two, that whole thing could come off really creepy and weird, right? Like he walks up, he's like, God told me to say this to you, and they're like, uh, dude, we don't have kids. I don't know what you're on, but uh, if you could put some of that into the food, our day might get better, right? Like, it just, it might be weird. And worse than that, um, Jake's manager, who was watching, he was in the area, was a noted atheist, right? So this could be a fireable offense to take this step. But Jake told me how he was obedient to God's prompting. And when he came up and told this couple that they needed to forgive themselves for what happened to their daughter, they broke down in tears. How could this waiter know this? And over the course of a few minutes, Jake was able to pray with them. He was able to, to walk them through an encounter with God. And after this happened, Jake's manager goes, come here. Like, uh-oh. Uh, yes, sir. How, how can I help you? Look, I don't, I'm not a religious man or anything like that. And I don't know what I just saw, but that looked like love to me. 
Isn't that amazing? God showed up, but Jake had to be willing to move on a prompting in his spirit. What could happen if we let God show up in our lives, even if, even when it pushed us out of our comfort zone? This is just one example. And I got to be honest with you. Do you know what no, my response was as his pastor, as his boss at the time? Dude, that's weird. Right? I'm not the only spiritual leper in the room. I'm not the only one thinking it. Uh, but the fruit of Jake's obedience was, was there. This couple had a visible witness that God hears even the cries that they express in their bedroom. Now, I've also seen this sort of thing go wrong, believe me. In fact, part of my skepticism historically is that I've had some encounters with people who claim to be speaking on behalf of God, but what they said didn't have fruit and it didn't line up with reality. I'm, I'm glad in Scripture it says test the spirits to see if they are from God. And so one instance of this, right, I'm leading this youth trip to Joplin, Missouri. We're doing some work after a tornado hits, and, and we are worshiping with a congregation we've never been a part of before. And, and this woman comes up to one of the girls that we brought on this trip. I didn't know that girl very well. She had a heart to serve. She was there for that. And, and, and this woman comes up to her and says... You need to prepare your heart because your sister is going to die. I immediately had two questions for her. One, do you have a sister? Yes. B, do you believe what this woman said to you? And she said, in the most faith-filled words I've heard, if God is saying that, I think he will tell me. Otherwise, I'm going to let those words go. And by the way... Her sister did not pass away. So there are reasons to be skeptical when anyone says the words, I heard from God. Yet, when I encounter people like Jake, who seem to hear things more clearly and, and take those steps to act on things, I, I, am, I am forced to confront inside myself that maybe I am the spiritual cripple. Maybe, maybe it's just that I'm afraid. Maybe I don't want to come across as weird. Guess what? The status quo has never changed the world. But there have been times in my life where I felt like God was speaking something more directly to me. Back before we launched Altitude Church a few years ago, I felt like God was leading me into a specific set of verses in Ephesians chapter 3. And then I started talking with Pastor Ron, who was the pastor of another church at the time, right? Like, it, we weren't one church like we are now. And it turns out that God was leading Ron and his wife Renee to the exact same text. The same text that is written on the concrete of this part of the stage right underneath me so that we are always standing on this truth when we proclaim it. And from the fruit of some conversations, two churches came together, the older of which was founded when Colorado as a state was just 11 years old. So that it's absolutely true that as a new expression of God's ministry in this city, we are both working towards our two-year anniversary and we are 136 years young. We have a history that goes all the way back to 1887. More recently, I felt like God was speaking to me as we were preparing for last year's Kingdom Impact Focus. See, I had felt for some time like we needed to go through the life of the prophet Elisha. But it never felt like it was quite the right time. And then last October, November, I felt... Okay, this is, this is God saying, let's move on this, right? But what you don't know is not only did I have that two months or so that I usually take to prepare my own heart as we go into a, a series or into a, a set of texts, but also when we were done with Kingdom Impact last November, I felt like God was telling me, stay here. And so for a year, every time I did my devotion, I started in... 1 Kings chapter 19, I kept reading 
day by day until I got to 2 Kings, roughly chapter 13, where Elisha's dead bones see this double portion miracle, this last one that doubled the amount of things that, that he had been a part of in his ministry that Elijah had. Every day for a year, I went back into these texts. And as we were praying this year about our Kingdom Impact annual series, I felt like God say, I I didn't leave you there for no purpose. It's time to go back into that text. And so I don't think this will happen every single year, but I believe that this year, God is calling us to go back into the life of the prophet Elisha. And so guess what? I believe God has some new words to say. Because even though we talked about some of these same texts about a year ago, your life has brought you different situations where your ears are hearing things just a little bit differently. And the question we had, have you ever felt God speak anything over to your life? I want you to know, I believe God is speaking and he will speak to you in his word and through the spirit. But see, as I mentioned, I'm often skeptical, right? I'm often skeptical about when people say this. That now, whenever I encounter this doubt or this, uh, this catch in my spirit, when there's, there's fruit and I'm seeing God move, but I'm just like nervous, I often think of something C.S. Lewis once said. He said, we regard our own state as normal and theurgy, that's a big fancy college word for the working of miracles, as exceptional, whereas... We ought perhaps to regard the worker of miracles, however rare, as the true Christian norm and ourselves as spiritual cripples. So as we begin this kingdom impact journey, I just want you to open up your ears, the ears of your head, the ears of your heart, the ears of your spirit, and listen for what God is speaking to you. Because if he can talk to a mom and a dad at a table through a waiter that they had no clue. He is talking to you and talking to us. So first, let's hear him in his word. I want to invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible that you allow to go through you on a regular basis, you can download one to your phone. Also, that same resource wall where you can get these impact guides, there's also paper copies of the Bible. And I would invite you to take one of those if you don't have it. Chapter 3, starting in verse 14. If you're the underlining type, underline this first sentence. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. For this reason. There's a reason that you stay awake at night, troubled. There's a reason why every time you think of a certain person, it draws your heart to to just these visible palpitations, right? For this reason. Think of your reason. When you read this this week, that word this, take it out. For this reason, put your reason in the text. I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge. It's bigger than information, so that you may be filled with all of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works, where? In us. us. To him be the glory in the church. That's the people, not a building. And in Christ Jesus, to who? To kids, to gray hairs, to the male pattern balding, to the woman dyeing her hair and going, oh, this still looks authentic. We see you. We see you. It still looks real. <laughs> to all generations, forever and ever, amen. Look at how that text begins. For this reason. What's your reason? 
something's coming to mind, even as I say that I bet. Maybe it's a situation, right? It's a, it's a bill. It's a problem in your relationship. Maybe it's a test coming up that you're studying for. Every one of us, whether we believe in God or not, have reasons to be on our knees in prayer. This week I was in Kansas for something called the Trellis Conference. Trellis is an organization that, among other things, has pioneered a program where students, churches, and three universities have partnered together to see an emerging generation get trained for vocational ministry. Back when I was going through that process, I spent four years in my bachelor's, three years in my master's, well over $50,000 that haunted us for decades just to go to school. Then I had another two to three years work of ordination. I had five different internships to get on the job training and see what it's like to actually work in this thing called the church, right? Trellis has pioneered this incredibly innovative path for students. Where across three years, they are part of a residency in a church. That's the the job training. They get a four-year degree in one year ahead of schedule. And they also go through the credentialing and licensing process so that in three years, they have three years of job training. They have their bachelor's degree. They have their ordination almost lined up. Oh, and by the way, because of the partnership with churches, They have the opportunity to do it debt free. Where was that when I was a student? (laughs) Right? Oh my goodness. Uh, But at this conference, I got to see what was keeping these leaders on their knees. One of the trellis leaders noted that according to recent studies done by Christianity Today, by the year 2030, check our calendars, that sounds like the George Jetson future, at seven years from now. By 2030, 25% of the current population of pastors will have retired. By 2050, they estimate that the U.S. population will be over 500 million people. And if those trends hold true and all of our churches just stay treading water, like no growth compared to the growth of our world, but just keeping up with the exact number of lives that are grown, every church in America would have to be 1,250 people just to stay average, right? But seven years from now, 25% of the pastors will have retired. And for that reason, these leaders kneeled, knelt, kneeled is not the right word, knelt before the Father who promises to do abundantly above and beyond all that we ask or imagine. While I was at that conference, I just... Oh, I had this little wiggle inside me. It was like, what would it look like if Altitude were a hub church for Trellis? Where we get to partner with students from across the street, across this aisle, across the country, and across the globe to train them up to do life with Jesus in vocational ministry. Oh, and by the way, they'd also get their degrees. And, uh, you know, if I didn't say it, they also have a dual track where you can get a business degree at the same time, because why not if you're type A, right? Add that into the mix. Just get it all knocked out at once. What would that look like? But we're not ready yet. We're not ready. We are not in that place yet. But what if that wasn't just a one-off story where in our pre-launch phase, we equipped a 22-year-old to go and lead lead a pastor, lead a church, and also see people baptized, and also train people. You know, our, our biggest win as a church is whenever we become spiritual grandparents. That's part of our discipleship experience on Wednesday nights. What if that wasn't a one time thing? Now, you've heard it before, that according to people who collect such data, this city This metro that we live in is one of the top 10 least churched cities in America. According to some people who are better at math than me, which I know doesn't take much, right? Uh, They say if every church in our city right now, not 2030, not 2050, but 2023, were to double tomorrow, we would still be among the least church cities in the country. Some estimates say that on any given Sunday, less than 5% of our city's population is in any religious service, not just talking about this church or the one down the street, but any faith service 
whatsoever. Think about what that does to a city or what it can do to a city when even just one more person encounters the transformative work of Jesus in their heart. When even just one more person says, I think, I think God is up to something. When even just one more person in this room or watching online says, you know what? I feel like God's telling me to go talk to that person, but it's weird. I'm going to do it anyway. And worst thing they can say is, uh, crazy person? Please back away, right? Amen. Go with God, brother, <laughs> right? Maybe, maybe God didn't put that leaning in your heart by mistake. Maybe you wake up each morning and you're reminded of someone, maybe it's a family member or maybe it's a person you work with that, that you just feel like God needs to get a hold of that person and not just needs to in like the weird guilt-ridden kind of sense of you should, right? But like, like God's, God's got something for that person. Maybe that person is you. Maybe you look in the mirror and you're like, God's got something for that person. I'm just not seeing it yet. But for this reason, you stay on your knees. God led us through this promise a few years ago. And I believe, although I sometimes walk in doubts, and I'm not saying that for any other reason than it's honest. The odds are stacked against all of us. <laughs> but God wants to do something in this city. And, and he's crazy enough, he's weird enough, that his plan is you and me. Yes. Yeah. Oh, for that reason, I stay on my knees, right? Yes. If that's not enough reason to stay on your knees in prayer, I don't know what is. But what if, what if God's preparing you in prayer? What if prayer wasn't your last resort, but it was your first response? Family, last year around this time, I gave this same key thought, but it's going to land on your ears differently because life has taken you to different places. The best way to prepare is to enter into prayer. Over the last year, I believe God's grown your faith in different ways. You are having these same set of words, but they're landing in your heart a little bit differently. Now, I mentioned we were going to spend some time in the life of Elisha. Let me tell you a little story real quick about Elijah. I know they sound the same, two different guys. Luckily, one mentored the other, so they kind of go together in that way, right? But uh, Elijah had one of these unmistakable instances where God showed up, right? Like, it wasn't just him going and talking to some random person. Like, he confronted 450 prophets of a rival god named Baal, or Baal, and uh, 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 they, they said, why don't we challenge you here? Uh, if your god is real... Why don't you call fire down? Because, you know, let's make it easy, right? So for hours, these prophets beat their chests. They cut themselves. And here's Elijah taunting them. Literally, it doesn't read this way in the English because, you know, sometimes we don't see the idioms or the way cultural phrases are used. But he basically says to them, oh, maybe your dude is on the toilet and isn't paying attention to you. That's some, that's some bold words, right? And then Elijah prepares an altar of sacrifice. He cuts up a bull. He dumps water on top of it, digging some trenches until the water fills up all around. Because again, why not make it easy on ourselves here? And he calls on the name of Yahweh, and fire falls. Fast forward, though. Because right after that, there's this wicked queen. Her name's Jezebel. Maybe you've heard of her, right? And uh, she says these kind of, Words. She says, uh, by the way, public service announcement, I am going to kill that dude. So Elijah, after having just seen God show up in powerful ways, uh, he does what any of us would do, relatable tweets. He gets super depressed. Like literally to the point where he's saying, God, please end my life. And God sends an angel a couple times with this basic message, take a nap eat some food, get some hydration. It's going to be okay. Literally, it happens a couple times because we don't listen the first time. You're like, God, seriously, you're asking me to eat? Like, that's what's going to solve my problems? That's actually the way I cope with solving my problems. It doesn't work out too well oftentimes, but he's like, dude, take a nap, right? 
And so God leads him up into this other experience. I'm going to fast forward because we're not spending too much time there. But he fast forward. In that fast forward, he, uh, he leads Elijah in, in prayer. It says 1 Kings chapter 19, if you want to turn there. In verse 15, the Lord said to Elijah, go and return by the way you came. Now, some of you need to hear that word today. Because oftentimes we want to go any other way than how we got here. But God says, go back the way you came. Through the wilderness, just so we don't miss that, of Damascus. When you arrive, you are to anoint Hazael as king over Aram. You are to anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mehaloah, as a prophet in your place. So Elijah enters in the season of doubt and prayer, and in prayer, God turns Elijah back to his world, this foreign king, right? To his country, the king over Israel, and to his future successor that he'll spend 10 years mentoring. The best way to prepare is to enter into prayer. So Elijah gets told, go back the way you came. Now, that seems a little backhanded, doesn't it, right? Like, Elijah's trying to escape depression. He's trying to run from his problems, and God's like, go into the wilderness. And that's not just there meaning the woods, right? That's metaphorical as well as it is the woods, right? But here's something I've learned about wilderness experiences and the hard seasons of life. When we don't figure out what God is doing in our lives, in the wilderness, we, we often bring the mistakes of the wilderness everywhere else we go. In his love and his compassion, God sends us back into the wilderness. He takes us back to those sources that, that seemed like they hurt us, to those seasons of running, because in those seasons, we learn that God can overcome any season. Oftentimes, our prayers, though, are prayers of escape. Yeah. God, give me a new job. God, take me out of this crazy family. God, if I just live somewhere else, someplace else, some time zone different, then my problems would be gone. But what we often don't realize is that if God granted those prayers of escape, it would destroy us. Think about this. If you're still the unchanged, same, untransformed person, when you get into that new situation, don't you tend to bring your own problems and the mud on your shoes into that new situation. And then after a little honeymoon period where things are different, you start to look around and go, things kind of look the same right now. What's going on? But in his mercy, and I know it doesn't feel like that at the time, God takes us back into the very wilderness that we're praying to escape because he knows, he knows huh, that when he does work in us, it changes even the wilderness. That kind of rhymes. When he does work in us, it changes even the wilderness. And so God often leads us deeper into the very situations and struggles that we're trying to run away from because they follow us home. And he needs to teach us to let them go away. What is your reason for falling on your knees before God? For me, it's been the people and ministry of Altitude Church. In so many ways, we've seen God start to show up in ways be above and beyond what we've asked for or imagined. Right? Last year, we saw a total of seven baptisms. In this season, across just about seven weeks, we saw 13 people step forward in faith and be baptized. A few years ago in pre-launch, we imagined what it would look like to have an impact into the high school right across the street and show visibly the love of Jesus. This year, a week before we even started High School Hamburgers, 61 students showed up because they wanted to be here. They wanted food too, don't get me wrong, but they wanted to be here. And we've seen up to 100 kids since then. That is incredible. I feel like God has given us this, this city-shaking vision that we can't do by ourselves. It's not just this church. It's the church. But there's always challenges, right? 
We're still praying to fund that city-shaking vision. It's been estimated that it takes the average church in their launch phase about three to five years to become fully self-sustaining through the way that God intends for his ministry too. That is the tithes, the offerings from you and me, the first and best of what he entrusts to us. And so we enter into prayer. The best way to prepare is to enter into prayer. And I have to admit in repentance that even recently I've prayed defeated prayers Telling God that he, 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 this need in our city is too big. I, I don't know how you're going to come through. Sometimes I pray defeated prayers. And I want to repent of those publicly because while it's human and there's precedent for it, even Elijah, right after he sees this fire fall, has this defeated prayer. But what God tells him is he's going to teach him what it means for him to show up. Which is completely ironic considering what just happened on Mount Carmel. What just happened on the mountain with that whole uh, God wasn't in the rain. He wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the fire. He was in a whisper. Like all of that just happened. And God's like, I'm going to show you what it means for me to show up. That's the journey that we're on together this month. And it's a journey of prayer. As a church, one of the big reasons that we kneel in prayer is this kingdom impact focus. I've said it before, but let me say it again. Kingdom Impact is our plan to partner with God to see the ministry of the church fully funded and greatly increase our impact into the community. See, there was another reason that I was in Kansas this week because why go to Kansas if you don't have to? Apologize if I offended an entire state right there, but uh, why go to Kansas if you don't have to? It wasn't just this amazing conference at Trellis. It was that... The leadership of Trellis believes in what's happening here at Altitude. And as they're raising up these young mentors, these young leaders, they also wanted to help us have a hand in fully funding the ministry of the church. And so I got to step on stage. I wish this was one of those big novelty checks, but I got to accept this, this check from Trellis to help Altitude with a first dollar match towards our kingdom impact goals. And by the way, two other churches, one in Oklahoma and one in South Dakota, said, hey, we're in too. So that as you see on that little card that you walked in with, we have a need or a goal that would take about 105000 above and beyond our regular tithes and offerings because we're still growing. We're still discipling people into the gift of giving to see what we regularly do continue to be funded. And so Trellis said, how about with these two other churches, if we encourage your congregation by giving $30,000 to start that matching journey, let's celebrate that. (laughs) What is your reason? What would it look like for God to show up and shape and shake your family? What would it look like for God to show up as he leads you in prayer to invest your life into someone who maybe God gets a hold of and changes the future? And what would it look like if through the generosity of Altitude Church, we were able in the next couple years to become a hub for students, to get trained up for ministry in a way that my goodness, if that existed when I was younger, I know we say those things all the time, back in my day, but literally that would have saved decades of debt. As we begin our Kingdom Impact journey, family, I wanna ask you to pray. Now we've talked about this, but I'm not asking you directly to give, I'm asking you to seek God in prayer. And so in your bulletin, your weekly guide, There were two little cards. One wraps around the other like a prayer that wraps around us. That first one, I want to ask you to start praying, who is God drawing your heart to? Maybe it's a person that is far from him. Maybe it's the person in the mirror that you know needs to get close to God. I want you to start praying over this. And on the last week of October, We're going to bring these together as an offering. And like we did last year, we're going to put them inside this stage so that every time the word of God is proclaimed, we're speaking over those people that we believe God is ready to encounter. The other one is is this commitment card. Now, 
We launched this in January to show everybody that it's not a surprise. But I would encourage you to pray over this giving ladder, this generosity ladder. God, what I have is yours. What expression of generosity are you inviting me into to fund your church and more deeply impact the community? I'm not asking for you to give money to me. I'm asking you to pray and do nothing less and nothing more than exactly what God leads you to in prayer because I believe that God has a calling on his churches. And like we kind of talked about, what would it look like to look back a month, a year, 10 years from now, say, wasn't it incredible that God showed up? Right, like a year ago we were talking about, wouldn't it be incredible if we had like a six day week ministry like through the coffee house idea thing and people were able to come in and, and co-work and spend time together and experience a place that's welcoming and, and they could find community. And guess what? A year later, we've seen that become a reality. What is God wanting to do in your life that 10 years from now you'll look back and say, I wish I had started sooner? What's God wanting to do in your life that you're like, that's weird, but I think God is in this. What would it look like to change our city as we go give hope to the community? So I wanna ask you, your challenge for this week, really this whole series, is to pray over these two cards. Let the one envelop the other in prayer. This one we're gonna bring back at the end of this series in the end of October. This one we're gonna prepare for with a night of impact and get ready for our above and beyond offering in November, November 19th. But I wanna invite you into a time of prayer together. For this reason, I kneel. What's your reason? And what would it look like to lift up prayers of faith that bring you to your knees and take you forward into the community. Jesus, there are so many reasons that I kneel in prayer. A lot of them have to do with my own brokenness, struggles in my family, and just this, this idea of the church that seems so lost in our world today so left behind in this city, and yet I, I still come back to believing in it every time I turn around. God, there are a lot of reasons in this room that we come before you. I pray that you would take us back into the wilderness, not to hurt us, but because it's time to leave behind some of the hurt. It's time to wash off some of the mud so that we can move into a new season of above and beyond all that we ask or imagine. And God, you promise that that happens through your church. And so I pray that you would shake this city, not just through Altitude Church, but Ralston Creek Church and Restoration Church and Revive. There's a lot of our churches around here, God, through Red Rocks Church, God, through Flatirons Church, anywhere where your name is proclaimed. I pray that this body of yours would shake this city and that you would give us a vision for future generations and maybe even people in this room right now to, to walk with you in a new way. Jesus, thank you for forgiving us our sins, that we do not come before you with shame or doubt that turns your eyes away, but that you look upon us with open arms because we are your sons and daughters and you love us. God, as we continue in worship, I pray that we open our ears, not just the ones in our head, but the ones metaphorically in our heart and our spirit, and listen to you speaking today. It is in your holy name that we pray, God. Amen. Family, as you feel led, if you want to kneel right where you are at an altar at the cross, you want to stand in worship, I just invite you to respond to God's Holy Spirit as He is leading. Let's experience more of Him together.